If I don't get any presents this holiday season, honestly, I really won't mind, because this, this right here, is exactly what I was hoping for. LTXV version 0.9.7, it's not just fast, the quality has taken a big leap forward. Today, we're going to take a look at all four models that come with this version. We'll walk through how to get it running, how to install the extra dependencies it needs, test Allura, and how to actually make sense of keyframes. Now I've found that the base workflows provided by LTXV, they already do the job just as well as any custom setup I could throw together. So for the sake of making things clearer today, I've just pulled them together into a single, unified workflow. Makes it easier to explain, and easier to follow. What I want us to explore today are the two key variants, image to video, and image to video with keyframes. The second one works kind of like Framepack. I'm really just hoping it performs better than Framepack when it comes to generating videos from multiple images. Before we start, please give the video a like and subscribe for more clear in-depth tutorials like this one. It helps me out a lot. There are eight workflows in total, four FP8 and four GGUF. The reason there are so many is down to how the distilled model works. It needs a different pipeline compared to the base model. I'll break all of that down a bit more once we've had a proper look at the workflows. The first four workflows we're starting with are the image to video ones. So that's FP8 and GGUF, each with a base and a distilled version. And those are made up of several groups, setup, low res generation, latent upscale and add detail. The base groups and distilled groups do have a few differences. We'll go over those as we go. In the setup group, you've got the clip loader. It's using the basic T5 clip encoder. You've seen this one before, same one you used with Flux. The only real difference here is that the GGUF workflows use the GGUF versions of those models. And the reason's pretty straightforward. If you're using a quantized model, you might as well go all in and use a quantized version of the clip model too. Then it's just a case of checking if anything else in the workflow can be swapped out for a quantized equivalent. Next to that, we've got the positive and negative clip text encoders. Just a quick note, leave the negative prompt as it is. It already works really well. After that, we hit the LTXV conditioning node. This is where you set the frame rate, 24 frames per second. To work out how long a video you're generating, it's a simple bit of maths. Multiply 24 by the number of seconds you want. So if you want a five second video, it's 24 times five plus one. That gives you 121, that's the number of frames you need. You don't actually input that value here though. You do that at the LTXV base sampler. And here's a little tip. You can just do that bit of calculation directly inside the number of frames field, saves a step. Just below that, you'll find the load checkpoint and load image nodes. Now, if you're using the GGUF workflow, it's a tiny bit different here. You'll be using the GGUF loader instead, along with the VAE loader. Next, let's talk about where things start to really diverge. That happens in the low rest group. The base workflow is using a standard scheduler, whereas the distilled workflow switches it up with a list of sigmas. That's one key difference. Another change you'll spot is in the STG Guider Advanced node. The CFG values here are different. In the distilled model, they're all set to one. In the base model though, you've got one, 16, eight, eight, four, and one. That's basically the end of the differences between the two workflow types. The sampler itself is pretty familiar if you've used anything like this before. It's got the usual controls, width, height, and the number of frames. Now this bit's important. If you want to change the aspect ratio from portrait to landscape, or the other way around, here's how you do it. Right-click on the sampler node, scroll down, and click on Swap Width and Height. The next group we need to talk about is the Latent Upscale group. This is where you can choose to use either temporal or spatial upscale models to boost the quality of your video. It's also where the Add Details node comes in. This step lets you sharpen and enrich the look of your video even further. Just a heads up here, it's not just detail it adds. It also puts a fairly hefty load on your GPU, so I'd recommend going easy on it, especially if you're not on a high-end system. Use it sparingly and be ready to wait a while. It can take some time, particularly if you're working with longer sequences. We've now pretty much covered all of the workflows, at least the core of them. The only remaining variation is in the keyframe workflows, and the differences there are actually quite small. Rather than taking just one image as input, these workflows take three. And instead of having a single optional conditioning index, they use three, 
We'll look at those closely when we get there. So what I've done is load the same image into all four workflows. Same settings across the board, no prompts. I want to see how good the raw output looks straight out of the box. I'm also timing the generation process, but just the video generation, not the upskilling or add detail steps. The FP8 base version took around 4 minutes and 32 seconds to generate the initial video. The distilled version was noticeably faster, about a minute. The GGUF base version took 5 minutes and 39 seconds, and finally, the GGUF distilled version came in at just 52 seconds. I was honestly a bit surprised the GGUF base version took so long to finish. I suspect that's down to the VAE, it might be what's slowing things down, but on the upside, it's definitely easier on the system. It took longer, yes, but it wasn't hammering the hardware nearly as hard. Next up, let's take a look at the keyframe workflows. For this test, I'm using three simple images of a camera in different positions. The idea is to see whether LTXV can figure out what's meant to happen between those frames. I'm hoping it doesn't just slap on a transition, but actually makes it feel like one continuous, coherent motion. Let's begin with the FP8 base model keyframe workflow. This one took about five and a half minutes, but the result doesn't feel cohesive at all. I think it's because the output is giving me something that looks more like a 360 view. What that basically means is it's trying to guess or fill in the blanks between frames that don't actually exist, and it's doing it with a bit too much guesswork. I'll wait for the upskilling to finish, and then I'll guide it a bit with a proper prompt. The prompt is a 180 degree horizontal rotation of a camera from left to right. The initial frames should show the camera facing to the left. Transition smoothly through the middle frames where the camera is facing straight ahead, providing a frontal view. The final frames should depict the camera fully rotated to the right. Emphasize a fluid, steady motion throughout the pan with consistent lighting and focus. This prompt gives me a better result. Still not perfect, but it's definitely an improvement it's worth keeping in mind that we're working with quantized models here. That means the quality is never going to match what you'd get from a large base model. And there's something else going on. It seems almost insistent on doing a full 360 degree spin, even when I'm asking for a 180. So I'm going to try something else. I'm going to increase the number of frames and double the length of the video. I've also reordered the images so the rotation goes from right to left, since that seems to be the direction it's more comfortable with. And because I'm using more images now, I've upped the steps to 50. I've also changed the number of indices, from 3 to 6, to match the number of images being used. The final video does show more frames, but it's still not quite what I'm after. So here's what I've learned from this little experiment. Rotations, especially large ones, are tricky. They're pretty much out of the question, at least with these quantized models, but side view videos, they actually come out quite a bit better, especially with the FP8 model. So for the rest of the keyframe testing, I'm going back to just three images. We already know now why it can look a bit strange with that setup, so I'm not going to focus on the visual quality too much. What I want to see is the time it takes to generate the video. Here's how it went for the remaining three workflows. The GGUF base model with keyframes took about six and a half minutes. The GGUF distilled model with keyframes took around 40 seconds, which was a bit of a shocker. And the FP8 model with keyframes, that one came in at one minute and 15 seconds. I don't think it's entirely fair to blame the models for the output quality we've seen, because let's be honest, we're not working with image generation here. This is video generation, and that demands a lot more from your system. Specifically, it takes up a ton of VRAM to generate results that even come close to looking decent. The real issue isn't the quantized models, it's the base model. That's where the power lies. The only downside is its size. These things are massive, and unless you've got the kind of GPU that costs as much as a second-hand car, it's hard to make the most of them. Honestly, I think it's about time AMD or Intel gave us something affordable. A GPU with at least 24 gigabytes of VRAM that doesn't require selling a kidney. I know Intel's just released one designed specifically for AI workloads, priced around $500, which is actually pretty incredible. If you've managed to get your hands on it, do let us know how it performs. 
it's genuinely exciting to see a bit of competition in this space. Because right now, buying a graphics card feels like taking out a second mortgage, and no one wants that. So what do I think of the LTX V model? I'd say it's a decent improvement over the previous version. When you're using it with a single image to generate video, the results come out much better than they do with the keyframe workflow. Where keyframes really shine, though, is when all the images are taken from the same angle, basically when the view remains consistent across the three images. You saw earlier, you can increase the number of keyframes as well. Just make sure the conditioning indices match the number of images you're using. That part is important. If you've got six images, for example, you'll need six indices set up to correspond. Also, don't forget that all the results we're getting here are from quantized models, which means what you're seeing is not representative of the full capabilities of the complete model. Let's look at one more test. I wanted to see how well it handles LoRa's. There's a huge range of models available on Hugging Face, but the one I was most interested in trying is called the Deflate LoRa. Here's how you set it up. You attach the LoRa model to the LoRa loader node, then connect the LoRa loader to the sampler node, load up the LoRa, the trigger word is deflate, and that's basically it. Let's see what we get. I feel like I'm missing something. Let me try connecting the LoRa directly to the sampler, leaving everything else unchanged. Actually, I think the first setup was right. Everything needs to be routed through the LoRa loader. Even so, it still produces a really impressive effect. Before any of this works, though, you do need to make sure ComfyUI is updated. Start by opening the Manager tab, click on Update ComfyUI, and then restart the application once it's finished. After that, you'll need to download and place the models in the correct folders on your system. First up, the FP8 model. Download it using the link in the description and place the file in the Models Checkpoints folder. Then download the FP8 distilled model and place that in the same folder. Next are the GGUF models. Download the quantized version you're going to use and move it into the Models UNet folder. Do the same for the GGUF distilled model. It goes in the Models UNet folder as well. Then you've got the text encoder models. Download the FP8 T5 model and place it in Models Text Encoders. Do the same with the T5 GGUF model, also in Models Text Encoders. And finally, the VAE model. Download that and place it inside the Models VAE folder. There's also a link for the LoRa models. You can download any that you want to try and make sure to place them inside the Models LoRa folder. That's basically it for setup. Now just drag and drop the workflow into your ComfyUI workspace. If any of the nodes are missing, open the manager again and click on Install Missing Nodes. Select everything that's missing, Custom Nodes included, and hit Install All. When that's done, restart ComfyUI again. Just make sure that all your model paths are pointing to the right locations on your local machine. That part can trip people up, so double check. Thanks for sticking around this far. If you found this helpful, Give it a like and subscribe for more deep dives and practical walkthroughs on using ComfyUI effectively. And don't forget to check out sneakyrobot.org. There are loads of freebies, workflows and ideas you can try out there. You might also find this video helpful. See you in the next one.